We're going to continue chapter 27, covering section 7, which discusses multi-loop circuits. All right, so let's start with a junction rule. Um, the junction rule says that the sum of the currents entering any junction must be equal to the sum of the currents leaving that junction. All right, so we have an example here. You have a junction here, and you have a junction here. What the junction rule says is that all the currents entering this junction must equal all the currents leaving this junction. So if you notice, in this one in particular, you have I2 that's going to be entering the junction, right? Because the current is flowing around this way. So the current is going to be entering this junction and then leaving this junction through I1 and I3. So what the junction rule says is that um, this current I2 is going to be equal to I1 plus I3. And we can see that here. Um, so this rule is often called Kirk, uh, Kirchhoff's rule, uh, Kirchhoff's junction rule, or Kirchhoff's um, current law. Um, so let's go ahead and look at um, what this means for us when we're, when we're writing our equations. Um, so if we look at this left-hand loop, right, and there's actually three loops when you look at the circuit. You have this loop here, this loop here, and then the big loop all the way around. Right, so let me get rid of that just to clear this up. So we're going to first look at this left-hand loop over here. And, and we said that the current is going to be flowing in, in this direction and then also down here. But through the loop, it's, it's flowing around like that. Okay. Um, so if we wanted to write an equation for uh, either to find the current or to find um, the EMF, depending on what we're trying to find, we would follow the rules that we've been with before. So as we go around, if our current is going with the EMF, we're going to get a positive EMF. So if we start here with B and we go all the way around, we end up with all right, this positive EMF. We'll call that epsilon 1. Uh, and then we run into this resistor. We're going with the current uh, when we hit this resistor. So that's going to be a negative. So that's going to be I1, R1. We're going around the loop and we get to this resistor, but we said that the current is in the opposite direction. So we're going to add this one. So this is going to be I3, R3. Okay. And that's going to be equal to zero. So that gives us one equation that we can use. Um, we might have more unknowns, so it might be helpful to find the, the equations for the other loops. So uh, let's go ahead and use the right-hand loop this time. Uh, and let's go ahead and start at B. Um, and then we're going to go, let's say, counterclockwise around B, right? sort of in this fashion. This way. So we started B, we first went into this resistor, um, which is R3, and we're going with the resistance this time. Um, so that's going to be a negative, of course. So you have minus I3, R3. Then the next thing you're going to hit is this other resistor, and again, we're going with the current this time, so we're going to subtract that resistor as well. So we have I2, R2. Right. And then we went into this EMF device, and we're going against it, so that's going to be another negative. That'll be minus epsilon 2 is equal to 0. Now, we can also do a loop um, for the entire circuit, so a loop all the way around. That's going to be our third loop that we could write an equation for. So for the entire loop, it's just going to be, uh, let's see, so we start here at epsilon 1, and we're going around to the left. We're going with the current, with the uh, EMF. So we're going to have a positive, epsilon 1. This first resistor going with the current, so that's going to be negative. Then we hit this resistor all the way over here, this R2 resistor. We're going with it, so that's also going to be negative. And then we hit this second EMF device going in the opposite direction, so that'll also be negative. And we can set that equal to 0. OK. Um, so when a potential difference, V, is applied across resistances connected in parallel, 
the resistances all have the same potential difference across them. Now, we, we've seen this before where, you know, if you have a battery, you connect a whole bunch of resistors in parallel, the potential difference across all the resistors is going to be the same, this, this initial potential difference of the battery. So resistances connected in parallel can be replaced with an equivalent resistance um, that has the same potential difference and the same total current as the actual resistances, right? So if you added all of these currents up, your equivalent resistance would have that current. Okay, um, so for instance, if we look at each of these currents, your this first current here is just going to be the voltage, which does not change, divided by R1, which is our resistance. This is just Ohm's law. Our second one is going to be the same, which is going to be whatever the second current is, is equal to the voltage divided by R2, and then same thing with the third. Um, and again, this voltage is the, is the potential difference across these two points, because everything is in parallel. Now, from the junction rule, we know that um, this, the total current, right, is just going to be all the currents added together, right? So I1 plus I2 plus I3, all right? So if this is I, right, the, the current of the actual, um, of the battery loop, right, you have at this junction here, you have I1 I2 and I3 all going out of it, right? So this current must equal to all of them added together. Right now, if you plug in um, what we just found previously and simplify, pull out the V, you get something that looks like this, right? So really, this is the equivalent resist resistance, right? This here is going to be our equivalent resistance if we were to combine all, the res all these resistors into one resistor. Right, because 1 over your equivalent resistance is equal to 1 plus R1 plus 2 plus... Okay. Right, and that's kind of what they show you down here. Um, the... All right, so then basically our equivalent resistance is going to be you add up all the different resistors in, in parallel. Right, and then what you end up with is a simple circuit like this, where you have this equivalent resistance. We figured out that the current is going to be all the currents added up together, um, and it's across this battery. All right, all right. So, so just summing everything up that we've talked about, all the different rules. Um, if you get stuck with these, I would just go back to this chart just to refresh. So, when you're looking at um, resistors and capacitors in parallel and in series. You know that resistors in series, um, you're going to just add all together. So this is going to be R1 plus R2 plus R3. But resistors in parallel, you know that you need to take the reciprocal of. Capacitors are the opposite. So capacitors in series, you're taking the reciprocal to find the equivalent. And then in parallel, you just add them all together. Okay. So let's do some examples. Okay, so the figure shows a multi-loop circuit containing one ideal battery and four resistances with the following values. So this is our original circuit that we're going to start with. You see that uh, this resistor here is actually in parallel with this resistor here, right? I mean, you could just move it down here and, and see pretty easily that, that it's in parallel. Um, so what is the current through the battery? All right, so we're trying to find the current I through this battery. Now, um, like I just said, note carefully that R1 and R2 are not in series, right? This is not in series with that. Right, so we can't just add them together. Um, however, R2 and R3 are in parallel, right? Because this is going to be in parallel with that. So um, we can find their equivalent resistances R2, R3. Now, we know that you could use this, right? Equivalent is equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2, and then you would take the reciprocal of that. Um, or one of the equations that we found is the resistance to 3 is going to be equal to oops, R2, R3, divided by R2 plus R3. Right? It's the same thing. 
whichever you decide to use. Plugging in the values that we have, we have 20 ohms times 30 ohms divided by 50 ohms, because we're just adding them together. So our resistance of R23 is going to be 12 ohms. Oops. Okay. So if we took these two that were in parallel and simplify them, we would get now just a simple circuit, one loop, um, both of these resistors formed an equivalent resistance here. All right, we know that the current through both of those was going to be um, the same, so we're just going to call this I1. Okay. Now, now we can, again, redraw the circuit, and note that the current through um, R23 must be I1 because the charge that moves through R1, which is here, and oh, excuse me, R1 is, is, is up here, and R4, which is down there, must also move through R2 and 3. Right, so this, the current that moves through these must be the same because it's one big loop. Right? Everything in, is in series. So for this simple one-loop circuit, the loop rule applied clockwise from point A. Right, so if we start here at point A, and we do the loop rule in that direction, we're going to end up with... All right, so we go through our EMF device. We're going in the direction, so that's going to be positive. So we get a positive EMF. Then we hit this resistor here. We're going with the current, so that's going to be a negative I1, R1, minus this resistance R23 that we found over here. So that's going to be I1, R23. And then we go through this final fourth resistor over here. So that's going to be I1, right? same current, and then R4. All right, and that's equal to zero. All right, so now we can go ahead and plug in what we know, what we're given, and we can simplify and solve for um, the current. All right, so our EMF is 12 volts minus I1. Our first resistance is going to be 20 ohms, as given in the problem. Subtract I1, 12 ohms. Subtract I1 multiplied by 8 ohms. And set that equal to zero. All right, so pulling out this I in each of the terms and then simplifying, you get I1 is equal to 12 volts divided by 40 ohms. So that's going to be about 0 0.30 amps. All right, so that's what the current through um, the battery is going to be. Okay, so we're using the same uh, the same circuit from before. So now we're trying to figure out what the current I2 is through R2, right? So this was our original circuit, and we found what the current through this battery is over here, um, but the current through this resistor is not going to be the same. So um, we're going to call that I2. Now we know that the current through I or through R23 it is going to be 0 0.3 amps, right? That was our equivalent resistor that we put in. All right, thus we can use this equation, or Ohm's law, and the figure to find a, the potential difference V23 across R23, right? So if we look at this picture here, this is was our um, equivalent resi a resistor that we put in there. We know what the current is. Um, we can find what the um, what the potential difference is, right? Just by using Ohm's law. So doing that, we have V two three is equal to I R. So that's just going to be I one R two three. Uh, plugging in our values, we have zero point three zero amps times our twelve ohms. And that's equal to 3.6 volts. 
Right. Now, we know that the voltage across both of those, across R2 and of cross R3, is going to be 3.6 because they're in parallel, right? The voltage is going to be the same in parallel. So the current I2 in R2 must be then, right? We're just going to use Ohm's law again, but this time we're solving for, for current. So the current just, just I2 is just going to be simply the voltage, which is 3.6 volts, divided by the resistance of just that resistor. So that's just 20 ohms, right? And that's equal to 0 0.18 amps. Now, the last part of the problem asks, what is the current I3? All right, so we found what I1 is. We found what I1 is, which is right here. We found I2, which is right there. Now I want to know what I3 is, which is what's going to be the current going through this loop here. Well, we earlier had the junction law, right? So that this, if we just look at this junction B, we know that uh, the current one is going into it and then the current three and the current two are going out of it. So using our junction law, we can say that um, I1 is gonna be equal to I2 plus I3, but I wanna know what I3 is, so let's solve for I3. So I3 is going to be I1 minus I2. So that's going to be 0 0.30 amps minus 0 0.18 amps, which means I3 is equal to 0 0.12 amps. All right, so let's work on another example. Um, we're talking about uh, real batteries in series and parallel. So there's going to be some internal resistance in these batteries or these EMF devices. Um, so let me just read the, the rundown for the problem. Um, electric fish are able to generate current with biological cells called electroplaques, which are physiological EMF devices. The electroplaques in the type of electric fish known as a South American eel are arranged in 140 rows, each row stretching horizontally along the body and each containing 5,000 electroplaques. All right, so if we go up here, we can see kind of a, a representation of what this might look like. There's 140 rows of this kind of going up. Each one would be a row. Right, so this is one row, two row, three rows, four rows. And then in each row, there's 5,000 electroplaques per row. So 5,000 little EMF devices in each row, right? And each EMF device is going to have um, the EMF and some internal resistance. Okay, so the arrangement is suggested in the figure, like I just said, and each electric plaque has an EMF of 0.15 volts and an internal resistance of 0.25 uh, ohms. The water surrounding the eel completes a circuit between the two ends of the electric plaque array, one end at the animal's head and the other at its tail. So this going all the way around here is just actually the water, and it's completing a circuit with some uh, resistance of the water. All right, so uh, this is a simplified over here in the next picture where you look at each individual EMF device and then each individual resistance or, or the, uh, I should say, the total resistance for each row and then the total EMF for each row. All right, so if the water surrounding the eel um, has a resistance of 800 ohms, how much current can the eel produce in the water? Right, and that's what we really want to know because the current that's in the water is what's going to be zapping these other little fishies that are, are uh, around it. All right, well, the EMF of the row is going to simply be 5,000 times the EMF of each individual electric plaque. Right, so you're just going to multiply it by um, the uh, EMF of, of the electric plaque. Right, so that's going to be equal to, oops, it's going to be equal to 5,000 times 0 0.15 volts, right? and we get a total of 750 volts per row. Right? So the EMF per row of electric plaques is going to be 750 volts. Now we want to know how much resistance is in each of the rows. Right? So our resistance for a row is just going to be 5,000, because resistors in, in series, you can just add together. So it's just going to be 5,000 times R. So you have 5,000 times, oops, this is going to be equal, 
5,000 times our resistance, which is, which is given as 0.25 ohms. And that's just going to be 1,250 ohms. Right, so the total resistance for each of these rows is 1,250 ohms. All right, well, the next thing I want to do is find what the equivalent resistance is across each of, um, of these rows, right? So the, basically the total amount of resistance inside of this eel, right? And since they are in parallel with each other, we need to use the reciprocal, right? So this is just going to be 1 over the equivalent resistance is equal to the summation of j is equal to 1 to 140 of 1 over j. So basically what this is saying is it's the summation starting at, at the first one going all the way through to the 140th one, right, we're talking about rows here, uh, of 1 over the resistance of whichever one we're talking about, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? And so the resist resistance is the same. So really this just simplifies um, to 140, 1 over the resistance of the row, right? So if you have one row that's that's um, 1 over the resistance, you have 140 of those when you add them together. All right, so um, again, we're just trying to find really what the equivalent resistance is here, so we can take the reciprocal of this to find the equivalent resistance. So it's going to be the resistance of the row divided by 140. So that's going to be 1250 ohms divided by 140. So our equivalent resistance is going to be 8.93 ohms. Okay. Last thing we want to do is, is a, or the, well, the first thing we want is, is to find what the current is, right? We want to know what the current is. We found out what the equivalent resistance is, um, but let's go ahead and, and do the loop roll around this simplified circuit. So we found the equivalent resistance. We found what the voltage is, because, right, the voltage along each row is going to be the same, because everything in parallel when you're talking about the voltage would be the same. All right, so that voltage is going to be there. And then this resistance of the water. All right, so let's go just pick a random point um, to start to, to, to write our equation. So let's start maybe um, at the EMF, and we're going to go to the left, which is with the current. So the epsilon of the row, and then we hit this resistance of the water down here, and we're going with the current, so that's going to be negative. So you have minus the current times the resistance of the water, and then we hit this other um, resistor here, so that's just going to be... Again, the current times the equivalent resistance. Okay, uh, set that equal to zero. All right, so now we want to solve this for i. We want to pull out i in each of these terms. And when you do that, you get i, which is our current, is equal to epsilon of the row divided by the resistance of the water plus the resistance of the, uh, excuse me, the equivalent resistance. Okay. And then plugging in the values that we just found up here, you get 0 0.927 amps. Oops, 927 amps. All right, so this is the current that's going to be going through the water, which is actually a significant amount of current. Um, it's going to do quite a bit of damage to, to anything that gets close to it. Okay, but I mean, this is a significant amount of current, especially to be going through a fish. So why doesn't the fish get injured? Well, let's look at the next part of the question. All right, so the next part is asking us how much current, which so I in each row, travels through each row of, of, the, uh, of the eel. All right, so we can actually find this pretty simply. Um, we know that we know the current of the row, and we know that um, that's just going to be the total current divided by 140, right? Because it's going to be in parallel. So you can just divide it by 140, and you'll see that the current going through each row is actually only going to be 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative 3 amps, right? So thus the current through each row is small, um, about two orders of magnitude smaller than the current through the water. This tends to spread the current through the eel's body so that the eel need not stun or kill itself when it stuns or kills a fish. 
Okay. So one last example uh, to finish up this lecture. So we have another multi-loop circuit here, and they, they give you the, um, the EMFs and the resistances. Um, the three batteries are going to be ideal, so you don't have to worry about any internal resistance in the battery. Find the magnitude and direction of the current in each of the three branches. Okay, so start with a junction rule. So using arbitrarily chosen directions for the current as shown. So sometimes you might not be given the direction of the current, so you just have to pick which direction you think it might be going, right? And it'll kind of work itself out in the end, as you'll see. So if we start with, um, let's just say the current going around here is going to be like this, the current going around this loop is going to be like this, and then the current going through this center section here is just going to be down. All right, these are arbitrary directions that we're picking. Um, if we're wrong, we'll fix it later. All right, so using the direction that we picked, we can do a junction rule at point A here. We can say that I1 and I2 are going into the junction and I3 is going out. So I1 plus I2 is going to be equal to I3. All right, so now let's just look at this left-hand loop. We first arbitrarily choose the left-hand uh, loop, arbitrarily start at point B, and arbitrarily transverse um, the loop in the clockwise direction. All right, so again, you can pick which one you want, you want to start with. You can choose any starting point that you want. This, in this case, we're going to choose point B down here, and um, and then you can arb and then you can go around the loop in any direction you want. You go clockwise or counterclockwise. It just depends. Just make sure you are consistent with whatever you decide to do. All right, so we're starting at B. We're going to go clockwise around. Um, the first thing that we're going to run into is this resistor. We're going with the current, so that's going to be negative. Right, so we have a minus I1, R1. Next thing we hit is the EMF device. We're going with the EMF, so we're going to add that, EMF1. Next thing we hit is a resistor, and that's going to be with it, so that's going to be minus. This is the same current, I1, R1. Next thing we hit is this resistor here, which has the current of I3 and the resistance of R2. Um, however, with our, uh, our junction rule, we said that I3 is going to be equal to I1 plus I2. So to simplify the equations, to get rid of some of the variables, we're going to um, substitute in I1 plus I2 for R3. All right, so we're going with the current again this time. So we subtract. It's going to be I1 plus I2 multiplied by R2, which is our resistance. Okay. And then the last thing we hit is this EMF device. We're going against the EMF this time, so that's going to be a negative minus the EMF, where 2 is equal to 0. Okay, again, this comes from the junction rule, right, because this is I3. Okay, so at this point, we can plug in all the values that we are given and then simplify this equation. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. Um, we're not given the I values, so we have minus I1 times R1, which is 2.0 ohms, plus our epsilon 1, which is 3 volts, minus I1 times 2.0 ohms, minus I1 plus I2 times R2, which is 4.0 ohms, 4.0 ohms, and then we subtract off the final EMF, which is 6.0 volts, and that's set equal to zero. All right, pulling out all the I1s and all the I2s, simplifying everything, you end up with an equation with two unknowns. You have I1 times 8.0 ohms plus I2 with 4.0 ohms, and set that equal to negative 3.0 volts. All right, so this is what we're going to call equation one. Now we have two unknowns, so we can't really get uh, much useful information with just one equation, which means we need a second equation. All right, we'll call this equation one. All right, well, for the next one, let's look at the right-hand side. We're going to do the same thing. All right, so we're going to, um, this time we're going to start at point B again, 
and we're going to go counterclockwise around. So as we start at point B, we go counterclockwise. You get a negative here. We're going with the EMF, so you get a positive. In the next resistor, you're going uh, with the current, so you get a negative. Same thing happens with um, our R2. It's going with it uh, with the current, so we get a negative again. And then we hit this last EMF device. We're going against it, so that's going to be negative as well. Set that equal to zero. Do the same thing as before. Plug in all of our values for our resistances and our EMFs. And it's going to simplify to this equation right here, which looks pretty similar to our first equation. So we're going to call this equation 2. Not the same equation, similar. All right, so the next thing we want to do is combine equations. Now, this is a, a really easy easy one to combine. You have two uh, variables, two unknowns. What I would do in this case is maybe solve this equation down here for I1. So if, if I were to do that, you would have I1 is equal to, let's see, it's going to be negative 3.0 volts minus I2. 4.0 ohms divided by 8 ohms, right? And eventually you would see that, uh, and so then you would take this equation, this I1 equation, plug it into your second equation, right? Simplify. And you would solve for um, I1. Okay, so long story short, you get a value that's negative. Uh, 0.5 amps, right, for your current. Now, the minus sign signals that our arbitrary choice of direction for I1 is, is wrong, and we must wait to correct it. All right, so don't change anything yet. We'll leave it as a negative. We'll fix it at the end. Now, substituting this into the other equation, you can find I2, right, and you get 0.25. This is simply just solving a system of two equations with two unknowns. Okay. Um, so now that we found two of the currents, we want to find what their third current is. So I3 is simply given by our junction rule. So I3 is going to be I1 plus I2. And we need to be conscious of, let me fix this here. It's I1 plus I2. And we need to be conscious of our, um, our positive, positives and negatives here. We can't forget about them, right? So you have a negative... 0 0.5 amps plus, uh, excuse me, 0 0.25 amps. Sorry, I moved my screen over a little bit. Let me just fix this. Oops. There we go. Um, so we get... So this is just going to get us an I3 of equal to negative 0 0.25 amps. So we get another negative for the I3. All right, so the positive answer that we obtained for I2 signals that our choice of direction for that current is correct. All right, so I2, looking up here, is in this direction, so we're good with that. Um, however, the negative answers for I1 and I3 indicate that our choices for those currents are wrong. Thus, as the last step, we correct the answers by reversing the arrows of I1 and I3, and then we say that the current is going to be 0.5 amps and 0.25 amps. So this current is actually going to be in this direction, and we'll say that's positive, and then our I1 is actually going to be in this direction. And we can then call that positive as well. Okay, that's it for this lecture. We'll see you next time.